Greetings. Hello. Let's begin with a quick chant. Om Sahana Bhavatu, Sahana Bunaktu, Sahavrinyam Kalavavahai, Tejasvina Vadi Tamas Duma Vidvishavahai, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Okay. Hello, and welcome to my short talk on the anatomy of the hip. I'm making this recording for School Yoga Institute trainings, and we'll be going through my handout that I use for School Yoga Institute trainings. And you know what they say about hips? They don't lie. Oh, wait, that's what Shakira says about hips. You know what else they say about hips? Happy hips, happy life. Okay, maybe that's not what they say about hips, but we all have hips, and let me tell you, they do so much for us. If you're sitting right now, whether you're sitting on a chair or sitting on the floor, in order for that sitting position to happen, you have to be able to move your hips in a certain way to have your seat be comfortably on the ground. So we'll be learning all about the anatomy of the hips in this little session. And this session that we're doing together now will be primarily just sitting and speaking. I'll aim for the session to be about around a half an hour. And we'll be going through the hip section of the handout. And then later, I'll record some videos for us to do asana together, to, for us to do some movements together to feel all these principles that we're learning. So for this session, you don't need a mat. Uh, you don't need to be sitting on a yoga mat. Just doing some stretches, although you're more than welcome to. Do whatever you need to do for your own comfort. But primarily, I'll simply be sitting here and talking about this joint that we call a hip. So to begin, I'm going to share my screen. And I'll we'll actually start on a page a little bit earlier on in the handout. This is page 31, just to show the entire pelvis and just to show what exactly it is we call the hips. And I use this picture because this does, this does show all of the connective tissue in the pelvis. And boy, howdy, is there a lot. So if we're looking at the pelvis from this back or posterior view, we see the iliac crests, the bones, upper bones of the pelvis kind of fanning out. And you can barely even make out the uh, SI joint here. It's just so uh, covered by the connective tissue, primarily the ligaments here. So there's very limited range of motion available in the SI joint, just a little bit. But regarding the hips, of course, what we call the hips is simply a joint where the femur meets the acetabulum of the pelvis, where the biggest bone in the body, that being the femur, meets the pelvis. And this is a really important connection between two parts of the body. This is a really important connection between what we often call the axial skeleton of the spine and the pelvis and the perpendicular skeleton. And I know it's quite obvious, but obviously your spine goes through the center of your body through your central column. And then it splits, doesn't it? So the, our torso has basically bones all along the center of it, and therefore weight su supported down the central column. And then it splits into two sides, right? So just like when you're a kid and you put two blocks and then a block on top and then one block in the middle as you're making a little tower, this essentially is how our pelvis is structured. 
So there's a lot of force being distributed. There's a lot of force that the SI joint takes. So it's nice that there's all that connective tissue in order to keep it stable. And you'll also notice basically a tube of connective tissue essentially wrapping around the head of the femur in order to keep that hip very snugly, uh, very snug in space there in the acetabulum. So the shoulder joint, for example, is often described as a golf ball on a tee. It's a very shallow joint. And as a result of that shallowness, it's fairly easy to dislocate your shoulder joint, right? Happens all the time. While the hip joint, it's a lot more snug. It's often described as an ice cream scoop in a cone, <clears throat> which is to say about half of the femoral head is really snug in there in the acetabulum of the pelvis. So it's super snug to begin with, about half covered. And at the same time, we have all this connective tissue keeping it in place. So it's pretty hard to dislocate your hip joint. Maybe an extreme uh, circumstance like a car accident might kind of pop the femur out of out of the socket, but that's that's very rare. So the other reason I want to focus on this kind of pelvis and the connective tissue and the hip joint here is, of course, how this might apply to something like trauma and also how it might apply to something like the chakras. So when we talk about the chakras, it's often described as some sort of like metaphysical uh, idea. And of course, getting into other realms of our body, such as the subtle body or energetic body or whatever you want to call it, it can be really exciting. But there tends to be almost this like bifurcation, almost this separation between our physical body of uh, the veins that circulate our blood versus the energetic body of the nadis that circulate our prana throughout our body. But, you know, we don't have to have this separation between the energetic and the physical because just knowing like where the chakras are and how they're correlated to the body, it's fairly intuitive. It's fairly straightforward. So we have our root chakra at the bottom of our spine. And what is at the root chakra? Well, it's our genitals. It's our reproductive organs. So of course, the root chakra is the more sexually inclined chakra right? Meanwhile, you move up the sacral chakra. That's a little bit closer to the sacrum, which we just mentioned. You move a further up to the solar plexus. Now we're getting into the digestive system. That's where our intuition and our gut instinct comes from. We move further up into the heart. Of course, we all know the heart is that place of love and compassion and kindness. Move up to the throat, and I'm speaking right now through vibrations in my vocal cords. And of course, the third eye, the place of insight, and the crown, the very top of our body. So just learning about the body, we of course realize centers of the body are devoted to different things. So I bring that up because you might attend a yoga class and they might, and the teacher might say something like, oh yeah, we all hold a lot of trauma in our hips. And I wouldn't like go that far to say like 100% fact that we all hold trauma in our hips. I think that's, that's quite the statement. Um, but when we do look at the hips, regardless of, you know, where the body does keep the score in the case of our trauma, we do see, of course, two things. We see, of course, our genitals and our sexual organs down here. And we also see a lot of connective tissue. So there is a lot of in really interesting research and corollaries into how uh, perhaps our connective tissue, like the fascia lines connect to the Chinese meridian system or even the prana system. So there's a lot of like really interesting connections there between our connective tissue and how we might think of the energetic body. But also when we do think about how the body keeps the score and how trauma kind of resides in the body. Some people are like, what does that mean? It's in my body. It's like, well, the issues are in the tissues. Just as when you get cut, there might be a scar there, right? That it is the result of a certain level of trauma that happened in your life remaining in the body. So, so too, of course, unfortunately, uh, there is certain things that happen uh, to uh, some people in their life that causes trauma in this area. So 
uh, we can recognize this as we do get into our hips and just bringing our attention to this awareness on this part of the body that maybe we kind of cut off for any particular reason early, earlier on in our life, it can bring up a lot of emotions. There's also just a lot of tightness in this area. We spend a lot of our time sitting, a lot of our time is fairly sedentary. So that can result in some hardening of, of the tissues and what we might refer to as tight hips or less mobile hips than perhaps we, we truly want. So of course, getting into areas of the body that we aren't normally in, bringing our attention and awareness there, working on parts of the body that we aren't normally in, going into joint motions that we don't normally do, these can all bring up a lot, right? It's intense. In fact, all of our forward folds in yoga have that Sanskrit, uttana, right? Uttanasana, parjva uttanasana, right? These uttana literally means intense or fierce. And it reflects how in a forward fold, you know your hamstrings are stretching. They are telling you we are stretching. It will result in a very intense sensation. And that is the same for a lot of muscles in the hips. When we do stretch them, we feel really intense sensations. And could it be trauma? Could it be emotion stuck in the body? It could be. We can always remain open to whatever arises in our practice. It could just be muscular. It could just be a muscle that we've never used uh, suddenly waking up. It could be some hardened connective tissue finally loosening, loosening up. So, of course, as we learn about our hip joint, as we get into it, honor yourself. When we do our asana later, you know, take it easy, take breaks. If certain emotions come up, you can pause. You can regulate yourself, ground yourself, call a friend, that sort of thing. Um, different things might come up and it just reflects the, um, what I'll say, beautiful complexity, beautiful complexity of this joint. So this diagram is in the torso section of the handout, and I'm going to jump ahead to the hip section of the handout. So lesson number six. And I really love this quote at the top. It says, you are like the tree whose magnificence lies not in the length of its branches, but in all the birds who trust those branches to build their homes. And I put this quote at the beginning of the hip lesson because, again, opening up the hips can bring up a lot of things. And these things are coming up for a reason. We're healing. We're growing. We're stirring things up a bit so that we can integrate it all together in our yoga practice. And we want to essentially make our body our home. And this is why yoga is such a powerful tool, because a lot of people aren't even aware of their bodies until there is a problem. And that problem usually is pain. We don't even feel our toes until we bump into the coffee table, right? So we want to move away from thinking our body is like this thing that we lug around and this kind of annoyance that like wants is in pain to seeing it as our home. Our home is our body. And it takes a while to build a safe and loving home, right? We might begin to listen to our body and wow, achy back, achy shoulder, bad knee. And that's when I think of another quote, which essentially goes, Listen to your body's whispers now so you don't have to hear it yell later. And that is one thing that we're doing in our yoga practice. We're tuning within. We're hearing the whispers now, right? You ever kind of wake up and you're like, ooh, I feel a little sore, right? That's a whisper. That's saying a little part of your body saying, hey, we need to do this. We need to stretch. We need to strengthen. We need to sit in a different position. And if you listen to those body's whispers now, we don't have to hear it yell later when that small discomfort turns into a big or larger discomfort. Okay. So we, we're making our body our home and honoring that it takes some time. But we want to come home to the body. And that's the beautiful thing about it. Every breath, every step offers an opportunity to come back home to the body. 
So just to give you a basic idea of the different types of joints that we have in our bodies is this course is essentially designed for like 200 hour uh, yoga teacher trainings. So a lot of this anatomy stuff is going to be relatively new. And I really encourage you to start simple, to work on the simple stuff before building up to more uh, complex ideas about the body. So indeed, when you learn about the body, we have 360 joints, which is a very auspicious number, don't you think? Isn't it so interesting that we have 360 joints, right? 360 degrees of a circle, just a food for thought. And, you know, in our scientific reductionist system, we love categories. We love splitting things into categories. So here we have the six categories of our joints. We have gliding joints. We have hinge joints, which probably are the ones most familiar to folks because we move our elbows and our knees and it feels very much like a hinge and we interact with hinges in our life. But we also have pivot joints. So depending on who you talk to, you either have 24 or 22 vertebrae. And some people don't include the atlas and axis in their uh, numbering of the vertebrae, which makes some sense because, of course, <clears throat> they're designed quite differently than the rest of the vertebrae. They are actually a pivot joint. So then we have ellipsoid joints, which we tend to have find a little bit more in those little small pebbly bones uh, in the hand. And then we have saddle joints more up in the fingers. And then we have the main event, especially for us yoga teachers, ball and socket joints. Although they are less common than some of these other joints, they are of crucial importance, not just to yoga teachers, but to human beings because a lot of very important movement happens through our ball and socket joint because the ball and socket joints are designed for a lot of range of motion. So the shoulder joint, as I mentioned, is one example of a ball and socket joint, which allows us to do all sorts of fun things with our arms. We can reach and we can hug and we can pick things up. And the hip is another ball and socket joint. So just knowing the general structure of the joint already kind of gives you a basic idea of what that joint can do, right? Now, this is always a simplification, like even calling the knee joint is a bit of a simple simplification. Even calling the shoulder joint a, a ball and socket joint is a bit of a simplification because really our shoulder joint is kind of like three joints working together. Um, but again, let's keep it simple. We're just learning about the body. We can imagine a ball moving in a socket and it's a pretty accurate uh, model of how the hip joint works. So there's 360 joints in the body. That can seem like a lot, but as a new yoga teacher, let's focus on the main one. So we did this in lesson one where we just broke down uh, yoga poses with their respective joint motions. And really, there's only a few joints that are of the most concern to us as yoga teachers. So we have the ankle, the knee, the hip, the spine, the shoulder, the elbow, and wrist joints. By and large, movement for these joints encompasses, I'm just making up a number here, but like 90% of our yoga poses are just movements through these joints. Right, and the, the ones of main concerns. So as you learn to break down yoga poses into their respective joint motions, then you're a lot more able to observe, like what does somebody need in order to get into this yoga pose? And not only that, but as a teacher, you're really, really able to observe what is happening in somebody's body, right? Like, oh, okay, you can really quickly uh, develop this skill of analyzing from bottom to top, where a person is in their body. And if they are aligned in the pose, you just do this quick scan, ankle, knee, hip, spine, shoulder, elbow, wrist. Are they aligned? And if you bring those joints into alignment, 90% of the time, the rest of the body is going to be in alignment. So some of these are covered in later lessons. And as I mentioned, this is a lesson on the hip joint. So here we have a few of the basics of the hip joint. 
we just learned it is a ball and socket joint that connects the femur to the pelvis. And as we know, as yoga teachers practicing this art of union, practicing this art of linking together, we know everything in the body is connected, right? Just, you know, you might break your pinky toe and then you realize, holy cow, all my body has to contort in a totally different position every time I'm walked just because of my pinky toe. So you will have, say, hip problems that will show up in other parts of the body. And you will have problems in other parts of the body show up in the hips. So I have yet to find a hip problem that didn't also show up in the low back and a low back problem that has not that, that does not also show up in the hips. Everything is connected. So restrictions in one's range of motion is going to affect other parts of the body, especially the lower back and knees, right? And you can just explore that yourself. Maybe we'll explore it in our videos later. Um, so good luck trying to um, find your hip joint. <laughs> and good luck also trying to uh, find the... Um, long head of the femur it is deep in there it is really hard to palpate maybe if you're a massage therapist and you kind of know how to dig around in there but it's pretty difficult to locate right you can feel your elbow joint with a hand you can feel your knee joint with your hand but this is a deep uh this is a deep joint and the femur itself is a pretty deep uh bone and we'll get into uh the bone the muscles that cover the femur in just a little bit and as I already kind of mentioned, a strong bundle, kind of a rotated tube of ligaments, if you remember, ligaments join bone to bone, bring stability to the joint. So here we have the primary hip movements. And we find this these hip movements available, just like in the shoulder, in any ball and socket joint. We have flexion, so obviously the leg can move forward. Extension involves the leg moving back. Abduction involves the leg out wide. A deduction involves the foot in. And we're not transparent beings, so we can't move our legs through each other. So something like a deduction is going to involve some other movements just to get there. And then we have external and internal rotation, also known as lateral and medial rotation. And we find all of these movements in a yoga sequence. Maybe day to day, you're primarily just doing flexion and extension, just walking from one place to the next and sitting in a chair. But when you come to yoga class, your teacher is going to ask you to do all sorts of funny shapes and all sorts of funny movements. And that is going to be very good for the health and happiness and stability of your hip joint. So what are some things we can note around these different ranges of motion? First, if you were like on your back or even standing and you were to, uh, without your hands, bring your knee up as high as you can or bring your knee as in as you can, you'll notice that your ability to bring the knee into the chest on your own is very limited. But as soon as you get the hands and you hug the knee in, it will be a lot closer. The knee will be a lot closer to the chest. And there's a kind of a lot of different reasons for that. A lot of it is literally just our other tissues uh, kind of getting in the way. Like if you kind of have some belly and some, you know, a uh, little, it's just this little bit more fat around the thigh. Well, guess what? It's going to get in the way a little bit, but it is uh, squishy, if you will, the very technical term, squishy. Um, it is pretty squishy, so you can obviously squish the thigh a little bit more into the belly, and it's not a problem. Um, but of course, other some of the other reasons it's harder to bring the knee higher up is simply the geometry or biomechanics of some of the uh, muscles that are involved in hip flexion. And so if hip flexion is moving forward, then hip extension is moving back. And there's a little less range of motion uh, in hip extension than there is in flexion. And a huge reason for that is restricted by our hip flexors, which tend to be pretty strong. And they're designed that way because we don't want to propel ourselves forward as we run and walk and that sort of thing. 
Um, so usually, you know, a person with a pretty deep forward fold, which involves a lot of hip flexion, right? Like if you're in a forward fold, right, that's like, you know, 100 degrees of hip flexion, right? Good luck finding that with hip extension, unless you're a contortionist or something. So we find our flexion in any forward fold of which there are many. And then we find our extension in any lunge position. So warrior one, high lunge, low lunge, et cetera. All of these involve having the leg behind us. A lot of our prone back bends will also have some hip extension anytime we're lifting the legs off the ground, like in, lo in locust pose. That will also involve some hip flexion. Next, we have internal or medial rotation. And this is a fairly rare movement. In fact, I've even talked to some uh, physical therapists who say, don't do it. Don't even bother because it's destabilizing for the knee joint. I'll leave that up to you to decide if it's safe or not. But the point is, it's fairly rare in yoga. You won't uh, find it very often. The one place you might find it is hero's pose. Uh, so thunderbolt is kind of when we are in kneeling and we sit on the heels and heroes is when we take the heels out and then sit between the feet. So in order to have the knees in and the heels out, uh, we have to have some internal rotation. And it's that pose that some physical therapists do not recommend because there's just too much uh, tension going around the knee. That being said, there are some recline poses where you might find a little bit of internal rotation. It tends to feel pretty good because there isn't a body weight on it. And really like the king of hip movements, especially when it comes to yoga, is external rotation. And it's so common and it's so hard for a lot of folks. So what we call sukhasana or cross-legged or crisscross applesauce, maybe you heard that one. Um, that involves external rotation of the hips. And you'll have all sorts of folks with their knees practically as high as their chest in a simple cross-legged position because they don't have that external rotation of the hips. But we see external rotation in so many other poses that are similar to figure four or pigeon pose, right? And all the poses that come from figure four, like flying pigeon and grasshopper. And then eventually those Ashtanga yogis, they get to the point where they can take their ankle behind their head, which involves some other mo movements too, but external rotation is a huge one. And if you're used to sitting in chairs, then external rotation is not going to be a movement that you find yourself in a lot of the time. So just as internal rotation is a, a little bit more rare than external, so too adduction is a little bit more rare than abduction, but you still do find a lot of adduction in a lot of poses, such as gomukhasana or cow face pose, and ardhamansi and dressna or half spinal twist. We have to bring the knee knee into our center line, but eagle is also a lovely example of uh, adduction and kind of exemplifies just how in order to get the hips adducted, we do have to bend the knees and hips in a certain way for the legs to uh, stack on one another. Because again, we're not transparent beings. I mean, maybe you are, in which case, in which case, hello from the physical realm. Abduction, however, super common, right? There's so many wide-legged positions in yoga. Triangle, warrior two, all the warrior two stances, um, like side angle and reverse warrior, of course, goddess, triangle, uh, even half moon is going to involve uh, abduction of at least one of your legs. So it's another, another very common movement. So we talked a little bit about the ball and socket. And here we have just a little bit more information about uh, how the bones of the hip joint is structured. So there's a few very uh, important uh, points here, namely that of the greater trochanter here and then the lesser trochanter down here. Now, when I said you can't feel your hip joint, you can probably uh, palpate your greater trochanter. It's probably the closest thing you can find. Um, you can't find the femoral head and you can't really find the, the, the neck of the femur. 
But if you do kind of find a little bony uh, protrusion on the side of your pelvis, that's not your pelvis, below the ilium, you can probably uh, find that greater trochanter. And, and if you think you're finding something else, it's probably your ischial tuberosities down there. Um, now, it's really important to note that our bones, our bone structure decides a lot of our movement, a lot of what we are capable of doing, particularly in our yoga practice. So if you've ever had the experience of stretching every day for 10 years, just to get into a certain yoga pose and then someone just waltzes into class, never done a day of yoga in their life, and they just plop into full splits or reach into king pigeon. A lot of it's just genetics. A lot of it is just how the bones have decided to develop along with the genetics of the connective tissues. So that being said, the structure of one's hip joint is going to decide a lot of uh, variability uh, in certain yoga poses. <clears throat> so even before you get to the hip joint, we have the pelvis, right? And in general, female bodies have a bit more of a wider pelvis, a little bit more external rotation, and male pelvises tend to be a little bit more uh, closed and internally rotated. Um, which has a lot to do with just pregnancy and holding a baby, first of all, and then uh, uh, birthing a baby. So there's reasons for that. So even the pelvis is going to be oriented in a certain way, depending on your genetics. And so to uh, some different aspects of the femur are going to decide uh, how your hip joint is oriented. So you might hear people say, I have wide hips, or um, I don't know, I have small hips. And first off, people's frames is largely going to be decided by the pelvis. But then look here, we have one pelvis, uh, one femoral head, which is almost at a 90 degree angle and goes down. But one is like practically uh, horizontal. All right, so obviously a person with this joint on the left is going to have hips that appear to be wider than somebody with this on the right. So if you remember our orientational terms, we can see how for most folks, the uh, acetabulum is oriented laterally, meaning to the side, anteriorly, meaning uh, forward, and then inferiorly, meaning down. But that angle is going to be very different. So you, sometimes you see people and they can come to a wide straddle and the legs can be straight, just perfectly straight. Uh, like, um, who's that ninja? Not, not the ninja guy, that'd be the martial arts guy that like does the splits. Oh, I'm totally blanking on his name. But you'll, you know who I'm talking about. It just, his legs are just straight out wide in a straddle split. And I guarantee you that has... Probably had to do, do some stretching, but by and large, that is just the structure of the bones. So, you know, if you don't have too wide of a straddle split, don't feel bad. A lot of it is just going to have to do with your femur bones. So there's going to be some great, a great level of variance across the population. Now, of course, we can still stretch and we can still balance the body and there's still uh, ligaments uh, that can open a little bit more but we're all different. So as we learn to love and honor our bodies, we can acknowledge uh, certain limits of the body. So as I mentioned, it's really hard to palpate the femur. And a huge reason for that is all of the muscles that surround the entire thigh. So even in Thai massage, sometimes we step on people's thighs when they're on their uh, bellies. And it's a pretty safe thing to do. I mean, don't do it like, don't try it at home. <laughs> but but um, you could really step on somebody's side because there's a whole cylinder, a whole tube of muscles surrounding the entire femur. So you can't, that's why you, when you feel into this leg, that's all you feel. All you feel is muscle. So there are over 30 muscles that support hip movement and stability. And there's different ways to kind of conceptualize like what the different muscles of the hip are doing. And I find it's really just easiest to think to divide them up based on what side of the thigh that they are on 
because that's going to really tell you um, what the muscle itself does. So what the action of the muscle does and what the, uh, what is going to restrict in the other, in the other direction. So just checking. Yeah. So stick in this page. So some of these we've covered in some of the previous lessons. So again, even when we try to isolate the hip joint and just the muscles around the hip joint, well, unfortunately, we have muscles that cross on other joints in the body. So of course, the psoas is one of them. Here he sees the psoas goes all the way from the lateral bodies of the vertebrae down and connects at the lesser trochanter of the femur. So that's also why I wanted to point out the greater trochanter and lesser trochanter because these are important origin and insertion points uh, for different muscles of the body. So your biggest muscle in your body is the gluteus maximus. And you think, huh, I wonder why that is. Why did human beings evolve to have, have so much uh, cushion back there? And the reason is because we walk upright. Next time you're at the zoo, when you take a look at the monkeys, check out their monkey butts, and they will have very small gluteus maximi. And when humans started walking upright, suddenly, when the, our axial skeleton, as it meets the appendicular skeleton, took a lot more weight. So we needed a lot more muscles around the hip to stabilize the hip. So we develop much bigger hip muscles and over 30 muscles to help us move around. So what else can we see here? Where does, uh, oh, I've asked this letter, I was coming very fast, I see. Um, so the gluteus maximus does, it inserts along, it kind of separates, but it does connect partly to the IT band, to so that band of fascia on the outer thigh. I think we might get to it later in the handout. And when we refer to the hamstrings, this is a group of muscles. We have the semitendinosus, the biceps femoris, and the semimembranosus. And as you are getting uh, deeper into the world of anatomy, that's a good time to learn the technical terms for things. So as an example, we don't say kneecap, we say patella. We don't say calf muscle, we say gastrocnemius muscle. And even I might be pronouncing these uh, incorrectly because I've learned a lot of this just from books. So again, we could kind of divide up uh, the different muscles of the thigh, kind of looking at just what side of the thigh that it is on. So we have the front thigh and the front of the thigh, also known as the anterior side of the thigh. This is where we got our quads. Okay, and quad, of course, means four, seps means head. So here we have four quadriceps, four heads that I'll meet at the patella. So again, just as we have a really strong gluteus maximus, we also have really strong thighs, of course, for locomotion. So you can thank your quads anytime you go up and down the stairs and up and down hills for helping you to bend and extend the leg. Now, when we talk about the movement of the hip, the main quads that we are, oh, the main quad that we are concerned about is the rectus femoris, which is not pictured here, but it is the only part of the quad that crosses the hip joint. Most of the other ones are used in knee flexion and extension but the rectus femoris does cross the hip joint. So it is one of your hip flexors along with the iliopsoas. And so along with the rectus femoris, the sartorius is another hip flexor. So, you know, you have your teacher teaching 20 students who don't know anything about the body, feel free to say hip flexors, right? They're not gonna know what they, you mean when if you say rectus femoris or iliopsoas, but you're more than welcome to teach these things to your student or to work on certain muscles that target these things. So the important thing to recognize about the hip flexors is that we stretch them in hip extension. <clears throat> so if you are looking for a deeper hip extension, then it's these muscles. And if you 
go to hip extension, you kind of feel it in your when, in your quads, for example, you know it's going to be the rectus femoris. So a lot of times, you know, we go to a low lunge, and we get to go into the deep hip extension to stretch the psoas, and then a lot of times, then we add the knee flexion and we pull the foot in, and that will stretch the other quads. So this is the front of the leg, and you can feel that, and you can feel all those lovely muscles at the front. And then at the back, we have the hamstrings, as we just mentioned. And the hamstrings kind of uh, separate on either side. They insert, they originate at the ischial tuberosities. They go down the back of the thigh, and then they kind of branch off. And they, they connect to both of the lower leg bones, both the uh, tibia and the fibula. And then we have our adductors, our adductor, adductor group. So we have the adductor brevis. Brevis kind of like brief, right? It's the brief one. Adductor longus, that's the long one. Adductor magnus, that's even longer. And then the gracilis, which is the only one that goes past the kneecap. So we tend to feel the gracilis in things like triangle pose, for example. And we tend to feel the smallest adductor of the group, the pectineus. So if I want to remember that, I go pectineus. I go really small. That's what the pectineus sounds like. I go really small and high pitched because it's the smallest one of the bunch. So usually when people say that they like uh, pulled their groin, for example, there's no groin muscle. But they usually are referring to the pectineus and people tend to pull their groins when they slip. So you like walk out of the house and you slip on some ice and then your legs, shoop, they pop out and the body's cold, it's not warmed up and it's in a wide straddle. It's in the abduction. So what's going to get pulled? Your adductors. And the one that's most likely to get pulled uh, to uh, more than it can stand is going to be the smaller one. So usually the bactinius is the first to go. So you want to watch out for that, okay? Next time you're in ice, don't pull your... Uh, pectineus. Okay. <laughs> but we do uh, do a lot of stretching of the adductors and all of our wide legged forward folds. And it's important um, to recognize that when we look at these muscles, we see just how like they're not perfectly straight. They're curving around, they're branching off, they're starting here and going there. And this is why it's so important to have a variety of poses at your disposal. Even just subtle little adjustments in a pose will get into different muscle fibers and different uh, parts of the body, right? So after you do your wide straddle, which is probably going to hit the more longer adductors, then you can do your butterfly, which is going to target the smaller adductors like the pectineus. And then you do your frog. Mm. Oh, and then oh, you just feel that frog opening up the hips and so good. All right. So... We've been talking about muscles, but we got to talk about this band of fascia, uh, the IT band, and the muscle that connects to it, tensor fascia. It tenses the fascia, right? So that's the muscle that connects to the IT band. And if you haven't found your IT band, grab yourself a foam roller, roll the outside of your thigh, and you can say hello to your IT band. So... Uh, so often fascia is just in little microscopic uh, little lines in the body, but sometimes it's entire bands, and we certainly have the case of the IT band. All right, my friends. And last but not least, we got the deep hip muscles. So deep doesn't necessarily mean uh, profound when it comes to the hips. It just means deeper into the body. So in order to see these muscles, you got to cut away the, glu uh, the glutes, so the max, the need, and the min. And then we can kind of see uh, what some of these deeper muscles are doing. And then we have the king, or what's, this will be the queen. How does that sound? It can be the queen of the deep six, the piriformis. Uh, this is something we tend to stretch in something like pigeon and figure four. It helps... Um, it helps to externally rotate the hip, but then when we do other th fun things with the hip, uh, it will stretch. And why do we know so much about the piriformis? Because of this guy right here, the sciatic nerve. 
which for some folks runs below or inferior to the to the piriformis, to others it's above or superior to the piriformis, and for others it's through the piriformis. So what's going to happen if your piriformis acts up or gets tight and pinches that sciatic nerve? Sciatica. Very painful experience, not fun uh, whatsoever. Of course, sciatica can happen uh, for other reasons as well, but that's definitely something to look at. And if you get a really experienced body worker, you could be like, hey, my piriformis is tight. And they'll be like, all right, lay down. And they should be able to palpate it and get into it. Um, but it's it's pretty deep in there. And then we have uh, five of the other deep six, which aren't nearly as popular. I wonder if it's just because of their names. <laughs> Superior gemellus, obturator, internus, and things like that. But I think it's because they do their job. They don't really, uh, they don't tend to cause too much trouble uh, for the body. They just really help to stabilize uh, the hip joint and do some of the more uh, tighter movements. So again, I'll record some other videos that will go into uh, stretching the hamstrings, but or stretching the muscles of the hip. But I'll just tell you a little bit about how this table works because as we learn about the body, we learn about our joint motions, and then we learn about what muscle does that joint motion. Once we know what joint motion a muscle does, we know how to strengthen it, and we know how to stretch it. So if you want to strengthen a muscle, just figure out what it does and do that thing. Biceps does elbow flexion. You want to strengthen your bicep, do some elbow flexion. You want to strengthen your hip flexors, then do hip flexion. You know, get some ankle weights, lay in the back, and do some leg lifts. That'll that'll strengthen the hip flexors in 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 good time. But if you want to stretch the muscle, you have to do the opposite. So essentially, to stretch your hip flexors, you have to bring your hip into extension. To stretch your abductors, bring the hip into a deduction. To stretch the hamstrings, you have to bring the hip into flexion. To stretch the adductors, you have to come into abduction. And to stretch the deep hip muscles, you have to come into external rotation and add some other joint movements in order to deepen the external rotation. So if you end this with pigeon pose, for example, the knee is bent so that we can apply a little bit more torque <laughs> on, the, on the femur. Um, and also, what else is happening in pigeon pose? The knee is up, so there's some hip flexion there as well. So aren't you lucky? Um, people usually don't have the answers on the side. <laughs> I might have to re-record this presentation because you have my little notes here in the video. Maybe you can't see them. Maybe it's blurred out. But feel free to use it. Feel free to be inspired. So that, my friends, my beautiful friends, my beautiful souls here, you made it to the end. That is the end of my uh, little hip sequence, little handout. I hope you learned something. And as I mentioned in all my anatomy lessons, this is your body. When we talk about the greater trochanter and lesser trochanter, you have these in your body. So this is a mirror and an opportunity to learn about ourselves. As a coach I interviewed once said, you can't change what you don't know and understand, right? So we can apply this to our unconscious patternings. For example, we have to make our unconscious patternings conscious in order to change them and live more free and happy. But we can't change issues that we might encounter in our hips if we don't understand them. So this knowledge should feel empowering. Right. Oh, that's why I have so much trouble in frog butterfly in my straddle because of my adductors. Oh, okay. So these are some things we have to work on. So I hope all of that makes sense. I apologize if I miss said anything or made any mistakes. I am perfectly imperfect, just like you. 
I might be wrong about some of this information. You think something as simple and uh, measurable and observable as the body would have a consensus uh, amongst the people that study it, but I talk to doctors and physical therapists and I get different answers to the same question. So verify any of this in your own body, see what you're capable of, uh, and use this knowledge to better your own practice and to be of better service to your students. Thank you so much for listening. Namaste. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti.